Given that for the first time in Formula 1 history, we are starting a brand new season with the exact same driver lineups in every single team as we ended the previous season, it gives us a much better gauge in terms of how each of the individual drivers are going to be against their teammates, what the dynamic is going to be, and also how they're going to perform in their respective teams. There's no rookies, there's no drivers moving teams, and so relatively, because of that stability, it's going to make it very, very interesting to see how these uh, driver lineups develop and how they can compare to last year as well. Nevertheless, this is my ranking of the worst and best driver lineups for 2024, beginning at number 10 and working our way up to the best lineup in my opinion in Formula 1. In 10th place, I have got the newly rebranded Stake F1 drive lineup of Valtteri Bottas and Zhou Guanyu. Now, let's just get this out of the way. I absolutely hate uh, Salba's brand new name, you know, Stake F1. So there is a bit of bias in me just putting them at the bottom because of the name. But no, uh, being serious, uh, he, there's nothing too wrong with this driver lineup of Zhou and Valtteri, but it, I think it's uninspiring is is probably my biggest problem. Uh, they're not necessarily kind of bad drivers. You know, I do think that Zhou had a bit of a disappointing 2023 because off the back of a, I think, a pretty solid 2022 rookie season, there was very low expectations. There was a lot of doubters, but he proved to be a, you know, capable and competent Formula One driver. But I didn't see him kind of kick on uh, in 2023, like I expected him to, especially up against Valtteri, Audi, who are taking the team over in 2026, are going to look at those two drivers with both of their contracts running out, you know, at the end of this year as kind of, you know, we could do better. Let's be honest, you know, these two drivers are okay, but there's definitely better drivers out there. There's better combinations out there as well. I think Joe especially is going to come under a lot of pressure. He's one of those drivers, he's getting into his third year, you know, and now he's, he's a very experienced Formula One driver. You know, once you get past your first year and second year, I'm not saying you're fully formed because of course you can improve, but he has got to, I think he's got to beat Valtteri to have any chance of keeping his seat. And as far as Valtteri, I think he needs a better teammate to kind of, you know, kicking up the backside a little bit. So of course it all depends on the car as well. They've been let down by their machinery, but again, whilst this lineup is by no means incompetent or anything like that, it's a bit uninspiring and I think there's a lot of lineups. In fact, every single lineup I think has to offer more uh, than what Stake F1 has right now. And next up in ninth, I have got the Williams lineup of Alex Albon and Logan Sargent. Now, if I compare this to the, um, I was about to say Alfa Romeo, to the stake uh, F1 lineup, I think Alex Albon does the heavy lifting. Let's be honest. I think he had, I think he's had a fantastic two years. I think his 2022 in a much worse Williams was also very impressive. But last year, he was just absolutely fantastic. As some of you know, I mean, he made my top five drivers of the year list. I think, you know, the fact that he carried Williams, he, you know, the points he scored by himself were enough to get Williams to seventh in the Constructors' Championship, their highest place since 2017. I think I've said that uh, a few times on my channel. So yeah, he bumps this driver lineup and basically he carries this driver lineup ahead of both Valtteri and Joe, in my opinion. But Logan Sargent, I mean, similar to Joe, and actually unlike Joe compared to his rookie season, there was a lot of crashes. There wasn't as much kind of, you know, pace shown and consistency throughout the season. So although he did end up scoring, you know, his first points uh, at his home race, he, to, for him to be at that team for the next kind of two, three, four years, I don't think he necessarily has to beat Albon in the, way, in the same way that Joe has to beat Valtteri, in my opinion. But, you know, with that 2025 driver market being as open as it is, Logan has got to improve because I think Williams, if the likes of Haas and Stake improve their car, it's not going to be enough for just Alex to carry the team again. So they're very lucky to have Alex and he's the only reason why I've rated this lineup above the lineup at Stake. But other than that, yeah, this lineup is all Alex Albon. And next up in eighth place, I've got the lineup of Haas uh, with the likes of Kevin Magnussen and of course, Nico Hulkenberg. Now, to be honest, I, do, I will admit, K-Mag had a disappointing season. I know the car was terrible and I mean, yeah, that house was just, it was frustratingly bad because the strange thing is, I mean, Nico Hulkenberg, what a return to Formula 1 he had. On average, and I found this stat amazing, on average, in terms of every single qualifying position over the course of the season, Nico Hulkenberg out-qualified Alex Albon. And I mean, I was just, you know, obviously I've been raving about how good uh, Alex Albon was last year. So for Nico to out-qualify Alex Albon and for that team to finish last in the Constructors' Championship, it just shows you that I think that I think the, the combination of Nico and, and Kevin is actually a really strong one. I mean, they're both very experienced uh, drivers. They're both kind of, you know, very solid, very reliable. You know, that whole kind of 
you know, the whole 2017 hungry interview potential tension uh, that people thought might arise, you know, they're, they're much more mature now. That was just the heat of the moment kind of thing. And I do like their combination. They seem to work together well. And I think they were just let down massively by their machinery. I mean, again, Nico outqualified Alex over the course of 2023. Uh, but then, you know, if the Sauber could do more than two laps without destroying its tyres, maybe they could have done a much better job in the Constructors' Championship. So, yeah, in terms of the driver lineup, I don't think that that's... Unlike Williams and another team that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, I don't think the driver lineup is a limiting factor at Haas. I think if they listen to their drivers and improve the car, then they have got capable enough drivers to where if they had a car that was as quick as the Alpine, you know... I think Hulkenberg and K-Mag are just as good in the right car as the likes of Gasly and Ocon. I mean, I know maybe that might be a controversial statement, but I think that's a very solid lineup. So yeah, nothing to panic at Haas in terms of the drivers. I think they, they've landed in a good spot. They've got the likes of Oli Bem potentially who could, you know, maybe put a bit of pressure on Hulkenberg and, uh, and K-Mag to, you know, up their game even more. No doubt that, uh, no doubt that um, K-Mag does need to have a better season. I think 2023 after a decent 2022 was, it was a bit of a step down in terms of consistency and quality, but with such a difficult car, especially on a Sunday, you know, what can you do? So, yeah, I'm expecting much better things on the car front from Haas because in some of their drivers, I think the combination of Hulkenberg and K-Mag is a pretty solid lineup. And next up in 7th, I have got Alpha Tauri with a combination of Daniel Ricciardo and Yuki Tsunoda. Now, this is the only lineup on the grid that I think we have the most unknowns because, again, we've seen all of these other lineups over the course of the entire 2023 season, so we kind of know how it's going to play out, but... I mean, this is going to be a big one. I think this is a very strong lineup with so many question marks. So I think that's the only thing that kind of stops me from putting it kind of any any higher on this list. Um, the only thing that I'm kind of looking forward to seeing is, is there going to be any tension between these two drivers? Because I think both Yuki and Ricardo are kind of cool characters. We don't, we don't really usually see uh, them butting heads with their individual teammates during, you know, throughout their careers. But with how much is on the line this year with a potential Red Bull seat, with the fact that we kind of expect Liam Lawson to be in that Alpha Tauri in 2025, that means that one of these two drivers potentially either won't be in Alpha Tauri or won't be in Formula 1 at all. And you know, that kind of rivalry where you basically have to beat your teammate uh, to justify your place in Formula 1, sometimes that can bring the best out of, out of both of the drivers and the team, and, and sometimes that kind of butting of heads uh, can be to the detriment of both of the drivers and the team. So yeah, overall, I think this is a very solid lineup, I think. Ricardo showed kind of, you know, flashes, especially in, Mo in, in Mexico, of the old Ricardo, that race winner quality that he had, uh, you know, and still clearly has. Hopefully he can replicate that over the course of the entire season, and no doubt he's going to want to push for that Red Bull seat. And as far as Yuki, I think he's developed into a really, really solid midfield driver. I mean, you know, he's kind of left that, you know, although he still has, you know, the incidents there and there, obviously that, that Piastri collision in Mexico, I think was really costly, but overall, I don't think he crashes as much as he did in his first two seasons, and he's developed actually into a really solid driver, especially when he was given a car that could score points. So yeah, I'm very excited to see uh, how this driver lineup pans out uh, more than more than anything in terms of how their futures uh, are going to pan out in terms of where, when, you know, are they going to be? Is Daniel Ricciardo going to get into the Red Bull? Could Yuki Tsunoda potentially beat Ricciardo and, you know, kind of stop his progress uh, up the grid? I think this is going to be a really, really exciting driver lineup to watch in 2024. And next up in sixth place, I have got the Aston Martin lineup of Fernando Alonso and Lance Stroll. And to put it simply, I think in the same way, exactly what I said for Williams, just copy and paste. Fernando Alonso, again, Fernando Alonso was one of only three drivers, which included Max Verstappen, Fernando and Alex Albon, who basically scored their entire teams at Constructors winning points all by themselves. Basically, whatever their teammates scored was relevant because their number one drivers delivered them the place in the constructors that they got. And that tells you everything you need to know about the kind of performance balance, let's say, uh, at Aston Martin. I think, you know, in terms of Fernando, he's just incredible, isn't he? When he was finally given the car, I think we all saw that this guy could still easily challenge for a world championship if he was given a consistent race winning car. All of those same qualities are just, they're still there, aren't they? That incredible uh, kind of race craft, that incredible performance on a Sunday in terms of managing tires, managing the race. Fernando has still got absolutely everything and still really impressive and good enough, in my opinion, in qualifying, which is, you know, sometimes been, um, the criticism of Fernando compared to the absolute greats uh, in Formula 1. So Fernando is an absolute, you know, surefire world champion still, in my opinion. But when it comes to Lance Stroll, he let the side down. The reason why this lineup is as low as it is, is because despite the fact that Aston Martin kind of tailed off at the end of 2023, 
Quite honestly, if Aston Martin had a Nico Hulkenberg or a Kevin Magnussen or a, P or a Piastri or a Ocon or a Gasly, I think they would have beaten McLaren in the Constructors' Championship. I think they had enough pace in hand, and certainly Fernando did a lot of the heavy lifting, but in the end, Lance Stroll cost his team a place in the Constructors' Championship by not being good enough. He got absolutely dominated uh, by Fernando Alonso, and it just leaves me a bit worried in terms of the optics of this team, because when you have a driver that is very clearly cost the team a place in the constructors and their, you know, their drive and their place of the team is not under threat and they're not having that pressure on their shoulders of, of being replaced like basically most of the other drivers have every single season. It just worries me a little bit. I do think Lance Stroll, you know, people say that he's going to keep improving, but he has had plenty of years in Formula 1. Lance Stroll is exactly who we think he is. He'll turn up, you know, four or five races a year and put in a, a you know, a good performance. Not great, but good performance. I mean, even when you look at Lance's best uh, races from 2023, in most of them, he still finished behind Fernando Alonso. So that just tells you the, the kind of the level of driver that they could have if they had two really great drivers. And it tells you what Lance Stroll is. He turns up, you know, three or four times a year to give some good performances. And other than that, he is just not good enough at the level that Aston Martin want him to be. You know, if this team wants to challenge for race wins and championships in the future, Lance Stroll is going to just keep on kind of bringing them down more and more every single season. So yeah, that is why this uh, lineup, despite the fact that it's, the, despite the fact that the X factor that is Fernando Alonso is in this team, to me it can't be any higher than sixth. And next up in fifth place, I have got the Alpine driver lineup, and almost similar to the Haas driver lineup. I feel like, again, this is just a really solid midfield lineup. You've got two drivers who are race winners. You know, both of them have finished on the podium multiple times. Just solid and consistent point scorers who, again, for the most part, don't really crash too much. So they're just, again, they're just a super safe pair of hands. But at the same time, they're not kind of an inspiring driver lineup. I don't see any of these two, uh, despite how much I, you know, really like both of them uh, as drivers and as people, I don't see them, e you know, either of them as world champions, for example. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with this driver lineup, and if anything, it's actually the best thing about Alpine at the moment. I think their drivers are basically carrying the team because the rest of it is an absolute mess. The car was inconsistent last year, and don't even get me started on the management. I know that Bruno, uh, Bruno Faman was supposed to be the interim team principal, but now apparently he might be the full-time team principal because they still haven't found so someone so yeah it's just a bit of a mess at that team and again their drivers are kind of the best thing about it uh, I don't really have too much more to say I think the only thing to look out for with this driver lineup is we did start to see towards the end of the year just a little bit of tension uh, beginning to arise in races like Suzuka where there was a bit of miscommunication so they need to make sure that and I think that actually that that kind of instability with the management of the team and I've talked about this before I think it kind of bleeds into the drivers as well they kind of have that paranoia that because there is so much chaos with the with the management there could be so much chaos with the driver lineup I think both of these drivers are going to be under pressure to keep their seat uh, for 2025 and again just as I talked about that with uh, Alpha Tauri I think that kind of that kind of environment where they're not sure if they're going to be kept on for next season might just uh, cause them to butt heads a little bit and that is the last thing that you want with two French drivers at Alpine so yeah keep a look out for that because I'm sure both of them are going to be under pressure uh, to perform and justify their position at the team for next season but in terms of their quality the drivers are the best thing about Alpine and there's no doubt about that in my mind and now before I get into number four I must really quickly admit that for the next two driver lineups or whilst pretty much, you know, making this list, most of these just kind of really came naturally, and I was really happy with the placement of all of these driver lineups. The fourth and th uh, the uh, fourth and third uh, spots were they, they were tough. Uh, as you can guess, I went back and forward quite a lot, and I'm still not 100% sure. I think you know you can flip this driver lineup um, in in your rankings, uh, whichever way you want, and I'd be pretty happy. So I, it was very very close between these two. But in fourth place, I have got the Red Bull lineup of Max Verstappen and Sergio Perez. Now, obviously, Max Verstappen it. It feels sacrilegious to put Max Verstappen in fourth place in terms of driver lineups because he, you know, like the likes of Fernando and like the, like the likes of uh, Alex Albon, he's, you know, he carried his team last year. So, but it is that Sergio Perez factor. And I think that it's a bit worrying. I think what we've all kind of uh, realized is that off the back of a season where Red Bull was so dominant, whilst it wasn't necessarily a worry that Sergio was kind of struggling then, if the likes of Ferrari, Mercedes and McLaren and Aston Martin do catch up in 2024, how much of a limiting factor is Sergio Perez going to be if he continues on the same form as he was last year? So 
that is the big worry with the Red Bull driver lineup. Is he going to be able to get on and kick on with the car as well? We know that Max just, you know, he takes to those Red Bulls like a duck to water and it's just a, and the car is just able to kind of get the best out of Max. And it's such a symbiotic relationship that led to, you know, the most dominant season we've ever seen from a driver where he broke basically all of the records. And so, you know, whilst in that context, it, you know, Sergio Perez being bad almost doesn't matter because Max and Red Bull are so good. If the other teams do get closer and, you know, Sergio does start costing Red Bull points and there is a lot of talent at the top, as we're going to discuss in a, in a bit, I think that's the only problem with this driver lineup. So I think all eyes are going to be, you know, we know what Max is going to be. He's going to, you know, be incredible. You know, he's going to win races, he's going to do his Max Verstappen thing as the champion that he is. But I think all eyes are going to be on Sergio Perez because when we talk about drivers under pressure to keep his seat, there is no one in 2024 that is more under pressure than Sergio Perez. And whether, again, is that going to bring out the best of him or is it going to, you know, make him crumble under the pressure? That's going to be a big thing to look out for in 2024. And next up in third place, and this was the driver lineup that was very, very close uh, with a red ball. And it is the McLaren lineup of Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri. Now, just to clarify, obviously both of these drivers are nowhere near as good as Max Verstappen, although maybe, maybe that's a bit unfair. I think, you know, Norris, I think in the right car could be a world championship caliber driver. So I talked about the Alpine lineup not having that kind of X factor or, you know, excitement about it. McLaren, it definitely does. I think Norris in the right car could be a world championship caliber driver. And some of the signs that we saw from Oscar Piastri, some of the raw pace um, up against a, a, a really quick driver in Lando Norris uh, was unbelievably impressive. So I think that is why when it came to judging McLaren versus Red Bull, in my mind, I just thought if you gave both of these drivers, all four of them, the exact same car, I just think that, you know, Norris would be a little bit closer, you know, to Verstappen, but I think Piastri would be a little bit away, you know, quite a bit ahead of, uh, of Sergio Perez. So that's the only thing that kind of made me uh, choose McLaren over Red Bull. As a combination, I think they worked really, really well. There wasn't too much tension, to be honest. I do think Lando also is going to benefit from a stronger teammate. I feel like, you know, with uh, Piastri getting better and better, I think that's going to cause Lando to up his game as well. So again, I talk about that kind of symbiotic relationship where I think both of the drivers combine. It's almost like, uh, but, you know, these two drivers are almost like more than the sum of their parts, I think. The, I think McLaren are really happy uh, for the future. You know, obviously they signed on uh, Oscar Piastri, I think, until the end of 2026. And I'm sure that uh, Zach is going to focus on signing Lando on another long contract as well. So, yeah, this is just a really, really exciting driver lineup. I think the only thing that it misses out on compared to the, to the driver lineups above it is just that experience and pedigree. I think, obviously, Oscar is still a developing driver. We're going to wait and see what kind of jump he has in his second year. And, you know, both of these drivers haven't won races, they haven't won championships, so I just think that's what perhaps, you know, that little bit of pedigree that they're missing, which I'm sure is going to come if they get given a good enough car, that's just what they haven't proven yet, so that is why they're behind the uh, next two driver lineups, but either way, one of the most exciting driver lineups, not just for the next season, but for the next kind of few seasons, is definitely this McLaren lineup. So it is between Ferrari and Mercedes, who is going to come out on top in terms of the driver lineups? In second place, I have got Ferrari's driver lineup of Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz. Again, actually two lineups that, to be honest, are so close and there is so much quality. Actually, another reason I should say, just a little bit off topic, another reason why perhaps, you know, it's a bit strange to put Red Bull in fourth is just is just the quality of the drivers we have up at the front. I seriously think we are in a golden generation with the likes of Piastri, Norris, Sainz, Leclerc, Russell, Hamilton. I mean, that, that is some serious competition uh, if you're, you know, a driver in the midfield and you want to try and get into one of these top teams because, yeah, all of them have such great drives. And so when it comes to the Ferrari lineup, I think it's a really, really strong lineup because there's so much to love about it. You've got that incredible raw talent and pace of Charles Leclerc. You've got Carlos Sainz, who's just this consummate professional, you know, so good in the races. And we saw, you know, when he when he does have the car at his disposal and like, especially a car that he feels comfortable with. I mean, this guy can just be ice cool delivering pole positions and even race wins. I mean, again, he was the only driver uh, to win a race outside of the Red Bulls in 2023. So, you know, I've got to put some respect on uh, Carlos Sainz's name. But, you know, if it does come to a championship fight, I'm always going to go with Leclerc. You know, I'm a prisoner of the moment in terms of what I saw in 2022. And both, when both of them for that brief period uh, at the beginning of the season did have a championship winning car. I mean, Leclerc was just as good as Max Verstappen when he had the car. So yeah, that's what I'm most excited about for hopefully these drivers to be uh, get given a much better car. But yeah, as a combination, I feel like 
um, you know, color signs, uh, there's still a few doubts that I have about color signs because as much as he had that purple patch at the, at the in the middle of the season, he did then drop off just a little bit at a time when Ferrari really needed him in the Constructors' Championship. You know, they could have beaten Mercedes last year and obviously they just uh, missed out in Abu Dhabi. But, you know, taking nothing away, this is still a fantastic lineup. Um, there's not a lot of tension between the two drivers as well. I think there's a really good kind of collaborative uh, partnership there. We did see, you know... I think like with all of these lineups and also with the Mercedes lineup in Monza, you know, when there was a podium on the line, I think it just went a bit over the line with Carlos Sainz. I think, you know, he drove Leclerc off the track. So I think that was just a bit over the line and that could have gone very, very badly. Other than that kind of slight bit of tension, I think the Ferrari, I think the fans love both of these two drivers. I think the team loves loves both of these two drivers. What contract they're going to give Carlos Sainz is something I'm really looking forward to because I think that's going to show how much they really value him inside of that team because on paper he's unbelievably close to Leclerc like when, when I talk about Leclerc is this amazing talent who in my opinion surely is going to be a world champion Carlos Sainz is no mug he is very very close to Leclerc over the course of qualifying which is not very uh not very easy up against a driver like Charles and then also in the race as well because I feel like Carlos is a much better driver on Sunday than he is on a Saturday uh but yeah there's just so much to love about this driver lineup but uh, how much does Ferrari really value Carlos Sainz? We're going to find out when we see what kind of contract he signs uh, with them potentially for the future. So that means coming in at number one, I have got the Mercedes driver lineup of Lewis Hamilton and George Russell. Now, there's no getting away that last year we did see a little bit of tension from this driver lineup. I think throughout different points, uh, both in and out of the car. Uh, I think, you know, some of the racing by Lewis went a little bit over the edge uh, in Suzuka, but... You know, he still always he always had the pace on a Sunday compared to Russell. And I think this is the really big thing because I think if some people think that Ferrari have a better driver lineup, I would totally understand because George Russell had a really, really bad season. Because had it not have been for Lewis getting disqualified in Austin, I think Lewis would have borderline dominated George Russell in the championship. I mean, he basically did anyway. Uh, he really did most of the heavy lifting on a Sunday. And despite how many people keep, you know, throwing around the fact that Russell is unbelievably close to Hamilton on a Saturday and, you know, they're the closest driver lineup in terms uh, in terms of their speed on a Saturday, which is true. And I think just shows kind of the quality of uh, Mercedes' drivers. On a Sunday, when the points are handed out and when, you know, it matters most, George Russell was just nowhere near Lewis, if we're being honest, across the entire season in terms of consistency, in terms of speed, and also mistakes as well at critical moments. So, you know, Mercedes kind of hung on. George kind of had a good, you know, last race of the season. So I think it almost masked some of his season because he had a, had a strong end. But it was Lewis who basically got Mercedes over the line uh, in the Constructors' Championship for second. And yeah, we definitely saw cracks, I think, in this driver lineup, a little bit of tension as well. And that's the only question I have, because the reason why this lineup to me is number one is just that raw ability. They're so close in terms of speed, theoretically speaking. And the quality is just, you know, unbelievable. Lewis, I think, had not maybe an maybe a bit of an underrated season he did make quite a few mistakes but he was just so consistent always in kind of the top six top five throughout you know the course of the entire season and i think ultimately that's what got him you know to third uh, in the drivers championship whilst russell i think he really let the side down yeah it was not a good season by george but again when it comes to the quality of these two drivers i kind of rank it still above uh, the ferrari drivers and so that is why i think for back-to-back -back years uh, retaining their title mercedes in my opinion still have the strongest driver lineup in formula one well, there you have it. That is my in-depth ranking of the 2024 driver lineups. Let me know all of your thoughts and your top 10 in the comments box below. And if you did enjoy this video, then don't forget to subscribe. That would be massively appreciated. And I'll see you in the next one.